Steve, yeah? Hey, hey yes. Uh, how you doing, Dave, man? Dave, how are you doing, man? I'm so excited to talk to you. Oh, it's great. I'm in, uh, I'm on, uh, in a really good pub in the King's Road in London called the Cadogan Arms. So I recommend it to anybody that comes here, okay? It's fantastic. So I just had a yeah, just had lunch with the Iron Maiden management lot. So I had a good chat. Oh really? That that perfectly ties into the movie we'll be talking about. Yeah, Um, yeah, it was great. It was it's the first time I've seen them since we made the film. So we had a, I mean, instead of them charging me money for the clip of the band, they just Uh said just take us out for lunch. So I went for lunch. So that was that. That was a bargain. Oh wow. Oh, well, I'm, ex- I'm excited to get into the movie, but, but first, uh, here at Bionic Buzz, we're all about people's passion. Where your passion uh-huh. for music came from led you on this amazing musical journey you had in your life. So, was a certain album, a certain live performance, something that was just natural for you as a child? No, it was not really. It was uh, a girl, a girl actually. Uh, this girl at college that I really fancied, and I couldn't pick, pluck up the courage to talk to her. So, my friend, we used to play for the football team and he said look what we need to do is get new strips we'll do a disco we'll print tickets and you go and sell the tickets to the girls right to the girl you fancy so i went across talked to the girls ended up giving them free tickets went back to see him he said how did you get on i said great they're all coming six of them he went oh it's great six times two pound fifty fifteen pounds i went well no really they're all on the guest list and anyhow, so he says, that's not a very good business model, but it doesn't really matter because it came to the concert. And then after we did the disco, we started making money. We're making like $1,000 every couple of weeks. Uh-huh. So that's how I got into the live, well, not the live, but the, the promotions game. But then the discos got really boring. But it's just like, you'd pay 50 quid for a DJ, make $1,000, or £1,000. So we reversed that. So we were spending a thousand pound on bands and making nothing, but it looked good, you know. I look, I look cool, you know. Yeah. So we're doing, we're doing like the Cure and Ultra Vox and Only Ones and Simple Minds and The Damned or whatever, but we didn't actually make any money, but we, it made us look cool. So that's how I got into it. As simple as that, really. Cool. And the cool thing is, in, in the movie uh, Skeevers, you show all this between your mates, like the football injury and. the putting together discos and it's all leading up to I guess uh Iron Maiden playing somewhere it looks like there's some shady doings you have to do to, to get this gig together you know yeah it's just uh well we had to borrow money we as often happens when you're um 20 or 21 and you think you know what you're doing you don't really know what you're doing and you, you end up borrowing money from people so we we were actually owe a few people quite a lot of money and the only way out of it was to, as it says in the film, was to do this big gig and make a lot of money, which which actually was a bit of a fluke. We didn't make any money, but we did make money and we managed to pay off our debts, but it didn't look like we would because yeah. we'd, hardly, we'd, we'd hardly sold any tickets in advance because I did no promotion. I was useless. I didn't put up any posters until two days before the gig. Uh, I, I didn't have any crew, didn't have any catering, didn't have nothing. It's just like in the film. It was a total nightmare. There's a recipe for disaster. But for whatever reason, on the day of the show, 11 or 1,200 people came in a walk-up on the night, which you'd never get now. And we'd sold two or 300 advance, so we made money. And we paid off our debts. Um, so that that's the way it worked out. Eddie looks cool doing it, too. <laughs> <laughs> and, but although, although we paid off our debts, we, we had some money left. And I thought it'd be a good idea to go to the casino and try and double it, but I lost it on roulette. Oh. Uh, and I ended up walking home about five miles in the piss and rain. Oh. So oh, that is no. the, that, that that was the true ending of it. Yeah. <laughs> Very cool. Well, talk about like putting together this film. It's kind of cool that you know most people sell the rights <laughs> to somebody else, but you actually you know made the film yourself based on you. You know. Well, I, n- I never really had any option because nobody. Would, like nobody else was interested in it. It's um, the band I managed, Placebo, were, were weren't touring, so I thought I have to do something. So loads of people said, write a book, do this, do that. You got loads of stories. I thought, well, a book's too hard. I'll just do a film. But the film's easy because if you do a film, you can make it look good because you get a good photo. Uh, what do you call them? Director of photography. So make it yeah. look good, right? Then you could get a great soundtrack. So that's good. 
And even if the script's absolute rubbish, at least it looks good and sounds good. So I thought I could write a half, I could write a half decent script. So it'll look good, sound good, and there's a few laughs in it. So it should do okay. So we did, like we just did it and it went number one box office, new release UK, got loads of, won loads of awards all over the world. It was really kind of surprising, but it was a good experience. And it, it was, I mean, I'm, I'm doing more, I'm doing loads more films. Oh, that, that's, cool. that's definitely my passion though, yeah. Very nice. Well, uh, my passion for music started in uh, late 1991 when I was 11 years old. I saw Smells Like Teen Spirit on MTV and my life forever changed. <clears throat> I used to yeah. start growing my hair, wanted to start going to shows. Um, so you collaborated with Nirvana, so I have to know all the details. What what all about it? You know, I never sadly never got to see Nirvana live. Well, that was great. That was probably the best um, kind of period of our promotion's life because we were mm-hmm. like we were just the concert promoters. Uh, we did about fifteen or sixteen shows of them, and. Um, what I always remember about Nirvana was, uh, I well, actually about all American bands that we used to do, like Soundgarden, Pumpkins, Pearl Jam, Rage Against the Machine, all that. They were all really polite. They were all really nice guys. It was really weird because they're a bit different from the other bands we used to promote, the English bands and that, and Scottish. And they were a bit different. I think it was because not a lot of them had travelled before. And they come to the UK and they thought, wow, this is different. This is great, you know. Yeah. They say, oh, what's that big building there? That's Big Ben. And what's that? That's Buckingham Palace. So it's a big house. Who lives in there? The Queen lives in there. You know, it's quite funny. You know? And um, we used to do the shows and get back on the tour bus with Nirvana and Kurt and the boys, mainly Kurt. He, he loved ABBA. And he would put on like Dancing Queen and so you know, like ABBA, the Swedish yeah. pop band. And they'd all be singing, going up the motorway with a disco ball in the, in the tour bus. And yeah, it was just amazingly great days, you know, and so exciting. The gigs were so lively, the crowd were crazy. And it, it actually went from us paying them £50 on their first show to offering them £500,000 for a show in Milton Keynes, wow. which never happened because obviously Kurt died. So yeah. in the space of four, four years, it went from fifty to 500000 So it shows you how quickly it all evolved and... Yeah, but they but they were like the like the besties ever, obviously. So very cool. You still it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I lost you for a second. It's all good. Uh, so you mentioned you got some new films coming. What else are? What are you allowed to talk about? Any future projects down the road? You know. Ah, well, I mean, I've got placebo. My band that I manage. I've got an album out this week. Should be number one in quite a few countries. Nice. Um, that's good. I was going to go and see them next week in Berlin, Paris, Amsterdam, Cologne. Brussels, whatever. But the COVID thing knackered that because you've got to be in a bubble. And if you're coming from a different country, you, you know what I mean? It screws mm-hmm. things up. So I'm not going to these shows now. Making another film uh, this year, which is following on from Schemers. It's me in London, 1986 to 1994, oh, cool. which encompasses a great soundtrack mm-hmm. and obviously culminates in um, the Nirvana stuff, promoting their gigs. But it's oh. also about me and my friend, my friend Scott, who's in the first film. He goes his way and I go my way. And he ends up dead, basically, in, in real life. Um, you just Google his name and Scott Young and you'll see what happened to him. So it's about us sh- sharing a house. I do all the music. He does what he does. We go our different ways. Very dark comedy. Very dark, but great soundtrack. So that's what oh. I'm doing. Doing that. I did loads, just films, books, bands, festivals, you know, all yeah. sorts of stuff, you know. Yeah, just keep it busy, like, you know. Yeah, well, I can't wait to see that, especially in the Nirvana part in that film. And, uh, well, thank you so well, much for taking just... your time to talk to me, man. This has been such amazing. Ah, it's cool, man. Just great. And good, and good to see you flying the flag with that T-shirt, because every place I go in the world, it could be Beijing, Tokyo, Buenos Aires, Rio, you see Nirvana shirts every place. And you can't say that about many bands, that's for sure, okay? That's for sure. Well, thank you, Dave. And keep up the Good amazing luck. work, all right? Top man. Great day. Have a great day. Good right, luck. Cheers. cheers. Bye.